So in this episode, I was going to talk about how I had completed the plumbing and I'd fitted one side of the kitchen together. But unfortunately, on day two of my project this week, um, it all came to an abrupt halt as I had a bit of an incident. I was kneeling down. I had just finished fitting some clips onto a batten. There was um, a angle that you'd hang a radiator on. Now they're quite sharp, fixed to the wall. I wasn't using any tools. I stood up and sliced the front of my knee open on one of the angles from the radiator brackets. So as soon as I realized that the, the cut was a bit deeper and a bit bigger than just a scratch and a plaster, and the fact that I knew that I would actually have to go to hospital, um, I thought, right, well, okay, I need to dress it because I need to get in the car and drive myself there. And I didn't want blood all over the car. So I um, cleansed the wound. I have um, got a number of saline tubes in my emergency kit and I cleaned the wound out. Um, I then dried it off. I put a, a gauze patch on top of the cut and then I had a roll plaster, wrapped it around the leg round the back of the knee, round, 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 and then I sealed it off with um, a, a bit of um, sticky plaster to sort of fix it in place. Um, I took a number of um, gauzes that, uh, uh, that soak up blood with me just in case it started leaking in the car. I am off to a and &E because I definitely need stitches. Um, I've patched it up, but it's bleeding and you can see right the way through to the the kneecap which is lovely it doesn't really hurt but it's about a good one and a half inches to two inch um, slice so anyway um, off to QMC oh. I got into a and &E, I, I signed myself in and um, a nurse quickly came out and put a pad on the floor so I could put my foot on it and and we laughed and and sort of because we didn't want to get blood all over the floor and it would put the other customers off we laughed at um quite quickly i went in to see a triage nurse um he indicated that i had patched up quite nicely i had done myself a lot of favors by cleaning the wound and patching it up in the way that i did um he redressed it and verified that yes i would need stitches which was done by a different nurse I went out into the waiting room, only a couple of minutes. This was normally about three or four minutes between each one of these. Now, A&E waiting times can be sort of hours, sometimes like three or four hours before you get seen. But because I think, I think it was because I was leaving blood everywhere I went, um, they sort of speeded up the process for me. Now, of course, because it is an open wound um, and because it is a bit gory, I'm going to give a bit of a warning now. So if you don't like blood or gore or needles going through skin, then look away now and I'll tell you again when it's safe to look. So you can look back again now. Um, they redressed the wound and they explained that in about half an hour or an hour, the anaesthetic that they had um, pumped into around the knee was going to wear off and the pain would start. So it was important for me to get some ibuprofen to stop the swelling and some paracetamol to um, aid the pain. Well, I've got my painkillers um, and I'm now back to the car. Um, and now I've got to get through this rush hour in Nottingham before it wears off and I need to get back on my boat. What a day, how to stop doing the plumbing. I was going really well, but still, anyway, 
these things happen, but I'm pleased I had a good first aid kit on board and I'm pleased I had my car right next to the boat. So um, I've got to go back in 10 days um, to a local doctor's and to get the stitches removed and so they can have a look at it, but it'll be fine. It's just a slice wound, but it's just quite deep and right on the knee, which is a real pain, but anyway. I also wanted to restock the things that I had used in my first aid kit um, because you never know when the next incident is going to happen. I'm not particularly accident prone. Um, there's some people that go to A&E or cut themselves every week, but it doesn't happen very often for me. But when it does happen, it usually does happen on a catastrophic scale, shall we say. But anyway. Um, I got back to the boat as quickly as I could. I took some paracetamol and I just took it easy. And for the last couple of days, I haven't really done that much. Um, bending the knee has been a bit difficult because the skin stretches on the knee, but I've let it, I've opened it up. Uh, I've taken the, the, the plaster off the top and let it breathe and um, it's healing up quite nicely. Meanwhile, life on the river saw carried on as normal. When I returned from the hospital, Molly clearly knew that something had happened as she barked at cows on the other side of the water. Now, she very rarely barks, so this was unusual for her and showed she knew something wasn't right. There's probably different levels of first aid kit that most people have in their home. Um, there'll be the very, very basic, which will probably be a, a five year out of date tube of Savlon and a, a box of half used plasters. And that's probably about it. Then you have a, um, like a family kit or a traditional green or red bag kit, which will have quite a lot of necessities. Or like me, I have quite an advanced first aid kit. Um, I always have done. Um, I went around the world backpacking when I was 20 um, and I felt it was important because I went on my own to have a good first aid kit. So it stemmed from then. Um, since then, I have worked for uh, 999, the emergency services, um, take in the British Telecom um, call centres, so taking the 999 calls and dealing with those. And then, of course, whilst working for BBC News, I've been out with many fire engine crews, ambulance crews, police crews and air ambulance. I was with them for two weeks and I got to see a lot of different surgical scenarios where people have impaled themselves, they've cut themselves um, and all sorts of different levels. So I've always kept a good first aid kit. With my first aid kit, I'm, I have four main areas. The front pocket has things like scissors, gloves, um, wipes, antiseptic wipes, the sorts of things that you would need first of all. The middle larger pocket, um, top left, has saline solution. They're in tubes so I can quickly get them out and flush out either an eye if I've got something in my eye or flush out a wound, clean it. Much better to use saline solution than um, water for example. On the right hand side of the first aid kit I have melalin wound dressing, I've got eye patches, um, I've got PFA dressings which would go directly on a wound. Um, all, all different sizes from quite small to medium to, to large. I've also got a, um, an emergency bandage. At the back of the main section I have a good first aid manual. Um, it's from St John's Ambulance and it's the 10th edition and it's quite detailed um, in all sorts of different areas. In the left pocket I have all of my sterile bandages and fabric dressing and triangular bandage for arms and that sort of thing. And then the final pocket is not for me. The final pocket on the right hand side is actually a first aid kit for Molly. You never know when dogs are going to get injured. Um, I had a previous Labrador called Sash and we were just out for a walk and she obviously trod on some glass or something sharp and she sliced one of her pads on her foot right clean in half. Um, limping away I got her back to her, the home and I got out my dog first aid kit 
and we sealed up the pad. I cleaned it all out and I put a bandage on and it healed up really nicely. Of course, injuries with humans and dogs are very similar, but the bandages have to be a little bit more robust because dogs have a habit of wanting to bite them off. So that's in the right hand side. Now I also have a small first aid kit for when I go out walking. Really tiny, fits into a pocket or hangs off a belt. It's got all main essentials. So um, scissors, antiseptic, melaline dressing, a bandage, a bit of antiseptic cream, um, some tweezers, plasters, all the sorts of things that you would need if you were out walking across a field or out in the woods. Nice and simple. If I was out in the middle of nowhere and that this incident occurred, I would have to deal with it myself. Part of my first aid kit, I do have some sutra stitches, which are basically very, very sticky, tacky strips. Um, you would, I would wash out the wound, pull the wound closer together and sutra stitch over the wound. And that would enable me um, a, a bit longer to either move the boat to an area where I could go to an emergency ward or um, to an area where I could get to a road and call a taxi or get on a bus. Um, it's exactly the same as other stitches, but it would just take longer to heal. All of those sorts of things I do have in my first aid kit because you just don't know what's going to happen. With me on my own, I could be out in the wilderness. I like travelling out and mooring up in rolling countryside. My mum always takes the mickey out of me because I say rolling countryside, so that's for you, mum. But I like mooring up in areas where there's no one around, where there's no vehicles, where it's lovely and quiet. However, those areas when you have an incident or when you have an emergency are a little bit more tricky to deal with. Now, a mobile phone, when you um, dial 999, which is the UK emergency number, or 112, which is the pan-European emergency number. Both of those go through to the, the same call centre. I know that because I used to work in that call centre. Neither has preferential treatment over others. It's a bit of a myth um, that if you ring 112, you get through quicker. It doesn't, it goes through exactly the same. If you looked at um, your phone, and I'm with EE, and I could see there was absolutely no reception, there is a system within the United Kingdom called Camped On. That means whenever you dial 112 or 999, it will use other services um, mobile phone reception. So for example, if I had nothing on EE, um, I could dial 999, and if there was a neighboring network available, for example, Vodafone, it would use that service and that's called a camped on service they can't phone you you can't phone anyone else but it's purely there for 112 or 999 emergency calls now a couple of years ago i took my previous dog sash for a walk um, i was miles and miles and miles away i like going on sort of quite rural walks with with the dog um, sometimes i camp out overnight get a little jerry stove and all that sort of thing um, I went for a walk, fell down this bank. It was almost like a sliding down the bank um, into like a, a scruff area where there was some woods. And I thought to myself as I sat in a bit of a heap at the bottom, I wonder what would actually happen here if I had broken my leg or I had broken my femur or I'd broken my arm or something quite drastic. I had no mo mobile phone reception and it was probably quite likely that there was no other coverage there. So how on earth would I get out of that scenario? Yes, I could drag myself up the bank, but then what do I do? I can't drag myself for miles and miles, especially if I've got a broken femur or an open wound somewhere. Um, and it occurred to me, what on earth would I do? Exactly the same scenario if I fell in the engine bay or I fell over something in the boat or I fell down on the, on the towpath, but miles and miles from anywhere. I have one final emergency um, get out bit of kit, and that is my spot. 
The device is battery powered and there are five different buttons on it. You can enable the GPS tracking and it will update a Google map of my position at set intervals. The OK button can be used as a check-in to say you're about to set off and here is my map location for example. The custom message button could be for arrival info. If there was a non-life threatening situation but I needed help, I can use the help button. I could press this and it could let my contacts know I needed help and give my exact location via GPS satellite. In the event of a life or death emergency, I can lift the right flap and press the red SOS button. The GEOS International Emergency Coordination Center provides my GPS coordinates and information to local response teams. It's for emergencies only, but does give me and my family that final peace of mind that I can get help if nothing else works. I'm not saying you need all or any of the items if you plan to live afloat. I'm just indicating what I have and why I feel it's important to be prepared when navigating on my own in rural locations. All the items I've discussed are detailed in the description below. So if I have an accident again, let's hope I don't. But if I do, I'm pretty sure I have all my bases covered. Um, I either have a very good emergency kit I've got a mobile phone that can ring, or if worst case scenario, I've got my spot. Um, so let's hope it doesn't happen again, and let's just crack on with getting the rest of the episodes out. My knee is um, fixing up quite nicely. I let it breathe, and it's healing. It doesn't really hurt anymore, but it has stopped me from bending over and doing quite as much, but that shouldn't be for too long, and hopefully the next episode will be back to normal.